All right. Looks like we are live and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie and I am your host and moderator for this evening's debate on the Genesis flood between Professor David McQueen and Jackson Rowe. Gentlemen, how are we doing uh, today? Good, good. <laughs> oh, we're doing very, good. very good. We uh, uh, have been, both of us, Jackson has been looking forward to it, and I have too. Those of you who have seen uh, Jackson and I debate about a year ago are aware that uh, one of the topics uh, that he has challenged me on uh, has regarded uh, shark's teeth. And I'm looking forward to going into that. But to honor our friend George in Australia, it's always good to start off with a joke. So, Jackson, you ready for a joke? You know, uh, I'm ready for it. <laughs> since you uh, and I live in the South, you in Arkansas and me in Louisiana, as we drive through the countryside, we see all kinds of uh, fields and we see cattle uh, in the in the full in the fields. Uh, the other day, I noticed near the gate to one of my farmer friends or rancher friends uh, uh, pieces of property that there was a cow standing right there. I wonder what that cow would be called. Oh, wait, that would be a cattle guard, right? Guarding the gate. That's not <laughs> really that funny a joke. So I'll turn it back over to Donnie. David, but it's a joke nonetheless, and that's what we appreciate about you because laughter is the best medicine, they say. And yeah, so true. David and Jackson, we have a couple true professionals here to engage this specific topic, the topic being the Genesis flood, fact or fiction. Now, by this point, both David and Jackson are experienced debaters. David, he's had a dozen or more debates at this point. Jackson, you've had a dozen or more as well. And it's been about a year since you both have duked it out in the debate dojo. That's so that's right. I'm excited to see this. I know the audience is as well. I'm especially excited to see what uh, David and Jackson, what you guys are going to bring to the table for for tonight. So Jackson, let's, let's hand it to you for a brief intro as well. Uh, how have you been? a little bit about yourself, and then also a little bit about your your channel. All right. I'm Jackson Rowe. You can, you can see right right over here. I'm, uh, you know, I kind of see myself as an ambassador between the two sides of creation and evolution because I'm not, you know, a jerk to any side. I'm nice to both sides. I try to be respectful to everybody, and uh, that's, that's like my signature that I hope everyone gets across. And uh, my, you know, I do like just some random videos every now and then. I'm not very consistent, but yeah, uh, subscribe to me if you want to. And I got a good presentation. I presented it on Aaron Ra's channel uh, yesterday. So if anyone watched that, they kind of know my presentation already. I probably should have scheduled it later with him because I kind of showed my cards before the debate. But uh, it's that's all right. We'll we'll go ahead and see how it goes anyway i'm anxious to see what david has to present so let's, let's get started all right you gave us all a good sneak peek yeah. on r and Ra's channel real quick david i'm going to go over the format before we hand yeah. it to you for the opening well i was going to make a comment about a new book i'm writing sure go uh, ahead uh, david yeah uh, take your time i am i'm writing a book called forensic geology and the idea of the uh of the book is uh, if you go to 10 different places in America, you can see evidence of the worldwide flood and the rocks of the worldwide flood that we're going to talk about tonight. So as that goes from a rough draft to uh, a contract to print it, write it completely, I'll talk more about it. Thank you, Donnie. My pleasure, David. That's great to hear that you're working on a new book, Forensics Geology. I got that right. Awesome. Okay. And for anybody, anyone who wants to see more from David or more from Jackson, do please check the description box of this video. I've got a playlist to all of David's content. And I've also got Jackson. I've got your YouTube channel linked for people to see. 
Okay, with that, let me go over the format real quick. So we are going to be engaging in more of a formal debate. We're gonna be having 12 minute opening statements. Obviously, uh, Professor McQueen is taking the affirmative tonight, the Genesis flood of fact or fiction. David says fact, Jackson says fiction. So David will be starting with openings. Then we're gonna have eight minute uninterrupted rebuttals followed by a roughly five to 10 minute break for our guests today. During that time period, I'll go over reminders, some announcements. We do have a lot uh, coming at you in the next uh, couple months. Then we're gonna have a roughly 40 minute back and forth discussion between the debaters, then a five minute closing statement. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We'll have a roughly 25 to 30 minute audience Q&A. And so please, if you do have a question for our guests tonight, just make sure you're tagging me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth, and that way I won't miss your question. Okay, Professor David McQueen, whenever you're ready, you are up for your opening okay. statement of 12 minutes. I'm setting my timer here, and I'll make a comment at the very beginning that if you see me wiping my brow, it might be because Jackson is making me uncomfortable but it also could be the heat <laughs> index here in Louisiana is 110 degrees. So the old the old preacher joke is, I live in Louisiana. There's no question that I'm going to go to heaven because I'm living in hell. It's so hot here at this time. <laughs> but that ends the joking part of it. Let's move now to a serious group of topics uh, in the debate. I'm going to change my style for tonight's debate. And in this first 12 minutes, I'm not going to use the number of props and uh, Play-Doh and other things that I've used in the past. But rather, I want to have what uh, amounts to uh, an old-fashioned fireside chat with uh, Jackson and the audience about the evidences that uh, are important when it comes to the um, worldwide flood and the outline that I have uh, worked uh, work on uh, in preparation for tonight is my argument, Jackson, is that first of all, a worldwide flood explains sedimentary rocks. That's S E D R O A R X there for my code for sedimentary rocks. I'm going to argue that uh, the worldwide flood explains sedimentary rocks best. And this includes sedimentary rocks that are found on uh, continental masses, creation week rocks, I'll come to call it as the debate goes on. And so these fossil bearing sedimentary rocks are on top of the uh, rocks from creation. And this is exactly what we would predict if there had been a worldwide catastrophic flood. Keep in mind the reminder that I've given many times on Standing for Truth. A lot of people watching our presentation have been taught that Noah's flood was 40 days long, 40 nights long, and that animals had their little heads sticking up out of the ark. Well, that's a childish childhood version of the Great Flood. The Great Flood did have different parts, a catastrophic, very intense first 40 days that I call Flood F1, and then an, another period going all the way up until Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1, where the waters begin to recede. So there's a rising of the flood waters, and there's a receding of the flood waters. Everyone had a birthday on board the ark, and so the ark uh, becomes uh, an image of salvation. Uh, and because at Standing for Truth, we're looking at the biblical foundation of uh, uh, understanding science, I do that without apology. Now, my first argument is going to revolve around how the sedimentary rocks that we see, and I'm going to emphasize what Jackson and I know best, and that's the 
sedimentary rocks of North America. And I'm going to point out throughout the debate how the presence of those sedimentary rocks in uh, the Appalachian Mountains, in the Rocky Mountains, in the basin in between, uh, provide a wonderful evidence for the worldwide flood. Now, Jackson and I have debated in the past, and one of the areas that he's challenged me on uh, has been the issue of shark teeth. And so I'm going to present the argument tonight from some study I have done uh, in preparation for tonight uh, that the flood is actually the best model to explain uh, the presence of shark teeth. From an evolutionary standpoint, the first shark teeth should be after the evolution of sharks in the Silurian. Uh, I'm going to present an argument where if you've got creatures living in the time before the flood that are similar to modern sharks, a modern shark uh, in a lifetime loses 30,000, according to the research I've done, 30,000 of, of his teeth in a lifetime. And so the fact that we uh, find uh, shark's teeth and occasionally find a shark uh, buried, but more importantly is since the sharks are mostly made of cartilage, even from a flood geology standpoint, the, uh, and I'll just call them S teeth, the shark teeth provide an argument for uh, the worldwide flood. I think I can explain their presence in the rock record uh, better uh, in that way. And then uh, the third thing that I want to challenge uh, both um, Jackson and also the audience, it dawns on me that this color is not showing up as well as I would like. Uh, I want to go to the formation of limestone and present an argument of how the changes in the chemistry of the worldwide flood actually provide the best explanation for the formation of limestones. In my favorite example, I like to use the micrite muds of the Bahamas. And so I'll write up this word. Micrite, which is a fine grain, smooth gray uh, limestone. If you imagine my shirt being a bit more gray than it is blue, that would be the uh, uh, the the shirt. <laughs> that would be the color, rather, of these micrite muds uh, in in the Bahamas. I would argue that the changes in ocean chemistry during the time of the Great Flood, the heat that would be produced by the flood, the changes in pH and EH during the flood provide the best explanation for limestone deposits. How much time do I have left by your timer, Donnie? Uh, I show that I have about five minutes left. Does that match you, Donnie? I'll just keep going here. He could have gotten to a cup of coffee by now. You never know. So how do we elaborate on these uh, uh, three points? If you look at the creation evolution debate and the debate about Noah's flood going back into the 40s when Dr. Henry Morris, my former boss, at ICR began working on this and you go all the way up through the fifties when he and Wickham were writing the book, the Genesis flood, as they would go from topic to topic, whether it be radioactive halos or, uh, varve deposits or the presence of fossils in the sedimentary rocks again and again, going all the way back before World War II, and certainly up in the 1950s, the mechanism of catastrophism seems like a better explanation. 
keep in mind that uh, the history of geology is said by many to begin with the idea uh, that preceded Darwin that um, the present processes at the White Cliffs of Dover, for example, in England, are fully adequate to explain the rocks that we see worldwide. My argument about sedimentary rocks here in the U.S., in the Appalachian Mountains or the Rockies, wherever you want to go, is that these rocks actually provide better evidence for a worldwide catastrophic event. An example that I'm going to elaborate on as the debate goes on is that if you go to a, a group of uh, Cambrian rocks uh, in the Appalachian Mountains and you trace those rocks that are called in Tennessee, they're called the Rome Formation. If you trace those rocks all the way up uh, the uh, extent of the Appalachian Mountains, and you go into Canada through Nova Scotia and across those those rocks, those sedimentary rocks that are found in Tennessee can be traced uh, to England, uh, to Germany, and all the way down to um, uh, northern Turkey. One of the arguments I'm going to give in the second half of this debate is the work of uh, Agar, A-G-E-R, who, not, not a creationist at all, but his idea of the persistence of facies across continents has tremendous impl implications uh, for the worldwide flood. By my watch, I'm at the end of the uh, first 12 minutes does that match your timer, Donnie? My timer says you've got about two minutes left, David. But if okay. you'd like to concede like your to, time. I'd like to push that on to uh, uh, the bucket, as I call it, and yield the rest of my time to Jackson and pick up those two minutes maybe in the rebuttal or at another time, Donnie. That sounds good, uh, Professor David McQueen. So with that, uh, that concludes your opening statement. David, thank you very yes. much. To those in the audience, if you do have questions, we are going to be getting you involved during the audience Q&A period. So just make sure you're tagging me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. The questions that have come in already, I'm all caught up on them. So, okay, Jackson Rowe, we now have your 12-minute opening statement. And so whenever you're ready, just let me know. And I right. will restart the time. If you do have some visuals, let me know that as well. And I can share your screen. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen right here. And I'm going to be taking notes, Jackson, on what you say. All right. Let, let me know when you can see it. Taking notes and sweating at the same time, right, David? That's correct. All right, can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Okay. This is just a simple experiment I did. Uh, I assume that the, the ocean salinity would be less during the flood, uh, just for sake of argument. So I watered lima beans with uh, one time only with uh, half with brackish water, half salinity of the ocean. The ones I watered that way didn't sprout. The ones I watered with fresh water did. I have them behind me. I'll show them in a minute. But that's just an experiment anyone can do to show that seeds probably wouldn't survive the flood. Now, uh, the Tuatera, moving on, is a lizard-like reptile native to New Zealand. If we're to believe the flood story, a pair of them either reproduced there and continued to move on to New Zealand, or a pair walked to New Zealand. But the, they have a low metabolism, and they die in warm temperatures, so crossing the equator is not a good idea. Uh, the population of Tuateras before humans arrived was in the millions, based on their current population uh, size and their range today. And they have a slow reproductive rate, so the odds of them getting there and then reproducing to uh, four th uh, in 4,000 years is not, not highly likely. Uh, an even less likely example, the Fiji banded and Fiji crested iguanas. Descended from iguanas of South America based on genetic evidence. Uh, 
and there would only have to be one pair of iguanas on the ark, according to most creationists. This means that in the Noah's flood story, the iguanas crossed both the Atlantic to get to the New World and then the Pacific to get to Fiji and diversify into these two species in, two th in 4,000 years. Uh, as you can see, that's quite a, a journey and quite, uh, yeah, it's just it's very unlikely. The Antarctic toothfish has uh, glycoproteins in its blood. It's adapted to cold water. Uh, most creationists admit the oceans would be quite warm. I, I believe uh, Dave McQueen said it would be warm. So fish like this would not survive the warm ocean temperature. They, they should not exist today, but they do. Uh, along with the warm oceans, the krill population would crash. The phytoplankton would crash. Everything would. Blue whales eat four tons of krill a day, and there are at least 20,000 alive today. So why would, why would the blue whales still be here? The New Caledonian coral pine, uh, Parasitaxis, is a parasitic conifer from the island of New, Z uh, New Caledonia that attaches to only one other conifer species there. The adult trees would die in a flood. Conifers do very poorly in water, let alone salt water. Even if the seeds survived, the seeds of both species have to land in the same spot on New Caledonia for the Parasitaxis to attach. The odds of this are incredibly unlikely. Even more unlikely, the Rafflesia, the largest uh, single flower in the world. It's a parasite to specific tetrastigma vines, which are themselves parasites of certain trees. Pollinated by flies, seeds dispersed by tree shrews and porcupines. Here's a list of things that have to happen for these Rafflesias to survive. The seeds have to survive for at sea for a year. The seeds are very small and delicate. Tetrastigma seeds must survive at sea for a year. The host tree seeds must survive at sea for a year. The pollinating flies must re reproduce somehow at sea because they don't have a long lifespan and survive for a year. The trees have to grow back, so the seeds have to wait on that. Tetrastigma seeds and Rafflesia seeds must land in the same location for the Rafflesia to take hold, and only the correct species of the 57 Tetrastigma species vine. The pollinators have to be in the area. The two species of mammal that eat the fruit of the largest species anyway have to repopulate Southeast Asia from Turkey. This must happen for all 30 Rafflesia species or they all, all should be extinct. And most butterflies and moths have a short lifespan. Luna moths and silkworm moths live for, as adults for one week. Birdwing butterflies pictured here about three months. And of course, they lay eggs on specific plants. Here's a monarch on a milkweed plant, monarch caterpillar. Adults don't live long enough to wait out the flood and, re and wait for the plants to grow back. So the fact that these butterflies exist is a refutation of the fl flood. Same for the Hercules beetle. With an adult lifespan of six to eight months, the larva and pupa live in rotting rocks, which would sink, the larva would drown, and the adult beetles would be unable to breed. Same for the titan beetle, which only lived for a few weeks due to them not feeding as adults. Larva haven't been found. Somehow, I don't know how they haven't found the larva, but they would drown in a flood, presumably. Mound-building termites. They cultivate fungus in their nests for food. These structures would be dis demolished in the flood, and the termites would have nowhere to live or feed, so they would either drown or starve, or a combination thereof. Aphids. Of the 5,000 aphid species, 99% feed on only one family of plants. Some of them feed on a lot more, as you know. After the flood, assuming aphids sur somehow survived, they have to find their host plant again thousands of times over, and the odds of that seem pretty slim. Firefly adult lifespan, two months. The larva burrow underground, which would drown, and adults don't have time to wait out the flood. The cicada... Adults live for a matter of weeks because they don't feed either. Uh, they, the larvae live underground, feeding on tree sap. So you can't really bring larvae on the ark even if you wanted to. You can't replicate that environment. The larvae would drown in the flood, and the adults wouldn't be able to breed. So why do they still exist? Ecosystems, they would take a long time to grow back. I'll just leave it at that for the sake of time. Pygmy goby, the shortest-lived vertebrate, has a lifespan of two months, and the species breeds in coral reefs. During the flood, these reefs would have been destroyed. 
why is the pygmy goby not ex extinct? It would have nowhere to breed, and they live for two months. Freshwater mussels, sensitive to water quality and salinity, turbidity. There are a thousand species, uh, 300 in the USA alone. About 90 of them in my state. I've found uh, like 30 of them. I, I, I look for them. They breed in a parasitic life cycle with specific sp fish species. Pictured here is a sandbank pocketbook. I take I took that picture. They have lures to lure in fish, certain fish species, to deposit their larvae in their gills. Salinity would have killed all freshwater mussels, but even if they had survived, they would have been separated by the flood from their host fish. Uh, the sandbank pocketbook and the bluegill. The sandbank pocketbook's only host fish is the bluegill. Bluegills would have been separated from the mussels in the flood, assuming turbidity and salinity didn't kill them. What are the odds they land in the same river system after the flood? The sandbank pocketbook, which I'm holding in my hand in this picture, uh, shouldn't exist. And they only live in a few states. They have a pretty limited distribution. Animal kinds that can't be kept in captivity. Pangolins, Indri lemurs, and tarsiers. Pangolins stress easily and must eat live invertebrates or in captivity freeze-dried invertebrates. Or gastrointestinal issues will kill them quickly. And stress kills them quickly. The Indries eat young shoots of specific leaves, which has never been successfully replicated. And they've tried it many times. Tarsus is even harder. Uh, they eat invertebrates, which would be hard to replicate on the ark. And they stress anyway. If you keep them in a wooden cage on a ship, they're going to die within a matter of days. They're just not, they don't do well in, even in modern conditions. I don't believe any zoo currently has any. I may be wrong about that, but if they do, they're in very unique conditions. Ant and termite eating kinds, such as the echidna, pangolin, numbat, aardvark, giant anteater, and silky anteater. Based on what the amount of ants they eat per day, I calculated you would need to bring 368 million ants and termites on the ship, Noah's Ark, for the year-long journey. And it's pretty good. That's a tall order. Coral, of course, wouldn't survive because of the light requirements, death requirements, and the turbidity and the heat on top of that. Same for salamanders, especially the aquatic ones. Well, any salamander. The diversification of the tortoise kind. One pair of tortoises produce all species today because they're all in the same family. There are about 80 species. There are three subspecies of spider tortoises uh, on Madagascar. Their eggs take about a year to hatch. They lay maybe a few eggs a year, reach sexual maturity at 10 years. Their population once numbered in the millions. There's simply not enough time to diversify into those three subspecies, get to Madagascar, and grow to that population size. Uh, manatees, seagrass would have been too deep to undergo photosynthesis, and manatees and dugongs don't die, dive that deep anyway, so they wouldn't have been able to reach them in the first place. So manatees and dugongs should have starved. Nesting beaches gone. Sea turtles would have to find all new nesting beaches because they imprint on their nesting beaches, so there should have been population crash at least of uh, sea turtle. Leaf cutter ants and the Leucogaricus fungus. Uh, they cultivate this fungus in their nest. During the flood, the fungus would have been killed by ocean salinity or other factors. Plants would not have been harvested due to them being underwater. Or the ants themselves wouldn't have survived, survived the flood. So how are any of these still around? Darwin's orchid and the Morgan Sphinx moth, a symbiotic moth and flower. After the flood, both species have to find each other again on Madagascar. Uh, the odds of this are astronomical. Migration on a new landscape. Creationists claim the continents changed to their current configuration after the flood. This poses the question, how did migration routes for birds, sharks, whales, etc. become established again? Honeybees, no food for a year. Honeybees have a lifespan of 60 days, the workers anyway. During the flood, their nests would have been destroyed along with their reserve honey in that nest. They would not be able to feed as all the flowers are under 100. One minute. Uh, why did bees exist today? Uh, this is actually one of my salamanders I took a picture of. Uh, there are 30, 130 species in the genus Politoglossa, all mature at about 10 years of age. How do these diversify from two individuals? And this is just the genus level. If we go the kinds, usually they say it's the family level. 
they're very hard to keep. This is one of mine. I had it for two years. Most of them live for a few months, so I did pretty well with this. But I kept it in very, very specific conditions. And uh, I sold it. I don't know what happened to it. Hopefully, it's still alive. <laughs> if all dinosaur kinds were on the ark, how did they go extinct? Ten when? seconds. What did you say? Uh, ten seconds. Ten seconds? Okay. Let's see. Uh, let's Here we go. The Mahode kind, a unique Hawaiian bird family. They would have had to travel 13,000 kilometers and diversify from two individuals into seven species, which seems like a, a tall order. All right. I ran out of time. Got quite a bit of slides left, but we'll, we'll stop it there for now. Jackson, appreciate the visuals in the opening. You are prepared for another 10 debates on this topic after this. So we'll have to make this a series. Gentlemen, that concludes the opening statements, David and Jackson. Good job and lots of interesting points for us to engage. And with that, we're moving into eight-minute uninterrupted rebuttals. Professor David McQueen, you get the first rebuttal of eight minutes. I'll give you a one minute warning, David, when you hit the seven minute mark, you. and then you'll kind of know to start winding things down. I'm gonna go ahead and set my timer right now and go for the eight minutes. You ready? Yes, you're good to go, David, the floor okay. is yours. Okay, um, I've made notes here about several of uh, Jackson's points. I can cover only a few of them in eight minutes as a rebuttal, but the rest will pick up uh, in the next hour and a half. Um, Jackson makes a lot of references as he talks about uh, the problems in keeping insects and animals and birds and so forth alive uh, during uh, the Great Flood. I think one of the things that he's overlooking, both from the standpoint of seeds that different birds eat, for example, and then seeds that would be needed of the different kinds of plants that uh, would grow after the flood. I think he's uh, minimizing uh, the very important fact that there were seeds on board the ark. On top of that, he's uh, ignoring one of the most important parts of the uh, historical account of uh, the Great Flood. Now, keep in mind that I view the Bible as a trustworthy historical historical di uh, document. And so it's true that eight people got off the ark with uh, the representative creatures uh, after the year-long flood. And they ended up in, in, in the area of, uh, of modern Mount Ararat, I believe. But one of the things that uh, is often overlooked by people that don't actually read what the Bible has to say is that Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, these eight people, were very intelligent, very um, resourceful individuals. So many of the problems that Jackson has um, suggested, like how in the world could certain insects that he pointed out, genus and species of, how could they live on board the ark? Well, uh, as Noah had all these years to plan and his sons and daughter-in-laws and wife could, could help him, he could certainly get certain types of wood that certain insects would need on board the ark, and they could have, they could have been uh, reproducing uh, as they build up to the time when um, the ark's door closed. Another point I'd like to make is that two of every kind came to the ark. So it's not, not as if Noah had to go out and find every kind of insect or every kind of seed that would be uh, needed uh, on the ark. Now, obviously, the seeds weren't going to walk into the ark. And so, uh, biblically, he and his family 
had plenty of time to gather uh, the kinds of foods that, whether it be an insect or uh, a tiger, would need to eat on board the ark. I always like to point out what happened to lions and tigers in the Berlin Zoo during World War II. All the meat went to uh, supply the needs of the uh, German army. And so during the war years, the lions and the tigers, other uh, presumed carnivores, uh, did quite well eating grains and seeds and so forth. Uh, the, what, what they might have been fed by a butchered pig, for example, um, was needed for the uh, military use. Quite a number of comments uh, from Jackson about how in the world could whales have lived uh, through the time of the flood uh, when they need so much of certain types of uh, foods to eat. Well, it's true that in our modern world, a, a blue whale or other types of whales have to have a certain type of uh, uh, food source. During the time of the, of the Great Flood, uh, there were no aquaria on board the ark. And so the uh, whales and the various fish that uh, Jackson has referred to were living uh, in the um, waters of the Great Flood. There were tremendous variations of temperature, salinity, pH, and EH all over the world during the time of the Great Flood. And so as the fish sensed a change in salinity, for example, in a certain area, they may have simply gone up into another layer of the floodwaters that had a salinity that, uh, uh, that matched them. ICR and its biological research over the last year has spent a lot of time looking at uh, certain types of fish that are blind living in caves, but when they're brought into uh, a sunlight environment experimentally or in the wild, uh, there's enough adaptability at the genome level that they uh, can develop eyes that can see. So there is uh, uh, a variation there that uh, is reasonable within uh, a flood geology model. The comments about iguanas that Jackson made again overlooks one of the details that uh, the modern creationist holds to, but Jackson seems to skip over, and that is that when uh, the ape got off the ark and began to settle in into the area uh, of the uh, um, area around Mount Ararat. As the population grew, um, and we reach all the way up to the time of the Tower of Babel, for example, one people minute, begin David. People begin to scatter worldwide, and they could have taken the iguanas with them where they need uh, need needed to be, and so these points, I believe, are a legitimate counter argument to some of the major points that Jackson made. And like I say, as the debate goes on, we'll cover these more and more. David, perfect timing. Johnny. Thank you for that eight minute rebuttal to the audience. We have a lot of fantastic questions coming in and I am all caught up on them. So I appreciate it. Jackson, we now have your uh, eight minute uninterrupted rebuttal. And so I am going to restart the timer Whenever you're ready, and the floor is yours. Donnie, one, one thing that you would help me is I'm going to listen to uh, Jackson's rebuttal of my argument, but could you drop my video during his eight minutes, please? 
Absolutely. All right. <clears throat> I'll start with his rebuttal, then I'll go to his uh, some of his opening statement. Uh, seeds on the ark, even if all of the seeds are brought on the ark of all the plants in the world, which seems unlikely to me, the distribution of these seeds makes no sense. For example, the, the Paris of Texas tree that I was talking about, I only found on New Caledonia, along with the other genuses, the other species in that genus are only found on New Caledonia. And New Caledonia is very remote. You can't just walk there. I mean, it's very hard to get to. Uh, and the idea of reproducing arthropods on the ark, maybe a few species, but there are tens of thousands of beetles, butterflies. Uh, this, this is just not feasible unless the ark is a hundred times bigger. I mean, it's, it's, you're going to need a forest. Whales, uh, I, not, I think he was suggesting maybe whales were eating other food, other foods. I'm not sure. Uh, turbulence of the of a worldwide flood would kind of cut up a lot of these ocean layers that, that he was talking about. And how would the fish know to get to the certain layers? I mean, before they reached the layer that was suitable, they'd have to go through how many layers that were unsuitable and how long do they have before this kills them. I mean, the turbidity, the heat, and the salinity of certain layers would disorient them. And I, I don't understand how that would work. Uh, he was talking about cave fish. Some species can develop sight again if you bring them out, but they're something called obligate cave fish, which uh, don't. If you bring them out of the cave, they simply die, basically, which is another argument uh, that I had in my slideshow. I didn't get to it, but cave fish like that, obligate cave fish, should have been killed in the flood because they require cool temperatures, low turbidity, low salinity, and darkness and all that. Now to his opening statement, uh, sedimentary rock. Uh, what about the igneous rock layers in between all the sed sedimentary rock? What about the KT iridium layer? Uh, that can't really be explained by a flood. What about certain fossils in certain locations, like this calamite, calamites fossil that I found right here? They're only found in the Carboniferous and Permian strata. It seems unlikely they would sort in this area by them up and nowhere else. And there are literally hundreds of examples of species like that. Uh, as for shark teeth, uh, they, they should be in the Cambrian or even the Precambrian due to their weight. And uh, the first small, simple shark teeth are, appear in the Devonian period. And they get gradually larger as, it go, as time goes on, uh, which doesn't make any sense in a hydrologic sorting model. And the heat used to produce, produce the limestone, uh, he said that that would have, I assume he meant that, that would have killed all the coccolithophores. Uh, the thing is, that would have also killed all the phytoplankton and krill and would have caused a total biosphere collapse of the oceans. So, uh, I mean, everything in the ocean would have gone extinct in this flood. Basically, 99%. I mean, some of the bacteria might have been all right, but I think a lot of the vertebrates, a lot of the, in, the bigger invertebrates, they would have been doing not so well. Uh, that's pretty much all the notes I have, so I'll hand it back to... Uh, <clears throat> You, Donnie. Jackson, that concludes your eight-minute rebuttal. You're bringing the heat. You're both bringing the heat. You're coming in swinging. This is good. Lots of points for us to go back and forth on and engage during the discussion period. Now, we do have our five-minute break, gentlemen, in order for you guys to get all refreshed and ready for... A roughly 40 minute discussion so during this five minutes i'll go over some reminders and announcements while you guys get yourself a drink go to the restroom if you need to or just sit back and relax i'm now going to go get all of my uh graphics that i stayed away from and uh, challenge uh jackson on several of these things thank you for dropping my video and i'll be back in five minutes okay all right well 
okay, Jackson, we'll see you in five. Or sit back and relax yeah, and thanks. enjoy the reminders and announcements. By the way, cool external mic. So you're you're stepping it up, uh, yep. Jackson. Looking forward to many more uh, debates and open mics. You've been joining us for quite a few open mics lately. Yeah. And for those that love the open mics, we've got one. You and I were talking. We're probably going to try and fit it in sometime in the next couple weeks. It'll be you and Kent, obviously, yeah. for the first hour, as we've been doing. And then we would open it up for the next four hours. <laughs> we've been going for about five hours. We start at 8 EST. And so the next open mic is either going to be tomorrow or Friday. Chances are probably tomorrow, but there's a small chance it'll be Friday. Either way, it's in the next uh, couple days. And so this will be another two-in-one show. Uh, Evidence for Evolution debate, Amy Newman and James W. will be debating Dr. Dino for the first hour on Evidence for Evolution. Then we'll open up the mic. After two hours, uh, Dr. Dino will leave us, and then uh, Sam and I will stick around for the last two to three hours, roughly, and engage in some open mic discussion and impromptu debates. So I'm excited for that. Uh, lots of debates this month, lots of main events, especially in the world of theology. And so we got a huge one at the end of the month. This one you're not going to want to miss out on. Protestants versus Catholics. Uh, Turretin fan and Dan Chapa, both well-known in Protestant uh, circles, taking on William Elbrack and Sam Shamoon, very well-known as well. And they're going to be duking it out in the debate octagon on the topic of the Assumption of Mary. So this is at the end of the month. Uh, they are all up on the channel in the upcoming live stream section. So make sure to hit that notification bell and uh, check it out just to see the exact dates and times. We've got an epic debate on full preterism coming up. This is in about nine days and two powerhouses in the world of eschatology, William Bell and Dr. Sam Frost. And so the proposition for this debate is the resurrection of the dead occurred in the past, 70 AD. That'll be William Bell taking the affirmative, Dr. Sam Frost taking the negative. And so I'm really excited for this. And this is going to take place right around the same time as the Protestants versus Catholics debate. We're working on setting up another open mic, not just on evolution, but we've got an open mic again on the nature of God. This will probably be for the first week of September, as August is pretty packed and I'm finding it difficult to fit anything more into this month. But anyways, this will be, is Jesus the father? Obviously controversial uh, question. And so Matt Slick will be here again, and we will be engaging in some some open mic debate. I saw uh, Doc in the chat. Good to see you. Doc and T-Rock will be battling it out on the topic of the age of the earth, the great age of the earth debate. That is this month as well, old or young. And so Doc had an epic debate with uh, Kent a few weeks back. If you haven't yet seen that one, please do check it out. Now, on Standing for Truth, we've hosted over both, both 330 debates at this point on all sorts of topics. Two topics we've never uh, debated here or hosted, geocentrism and flat earth. And so we've got uh, first time debates on these topics coming up. So this one this month, Taylor and Dr. Robertson Jenis on geocentrism. And then next month, Dr. Robertson Jenis again and Nathan Erickson. Flat Earth on trial. So that should be an interesting one. I've had a lot of people reach out to me over the last couple of years uh, looking for debates on this topic. And so we're going to get one in there. And I know there's a lot of excitement for it as well. We've also got in September quite a few big debates as well. This one's been set for a few months. And so this one we have Pastor Anthony Aquino and Dr. Don Preston, they're going to be engaging the great millennium debate. And I'm just looking at the chat. So creationist crybaby, good question. So I should say the one with Syngenis and Taylor, or Snake was right, this will be the first official debate, I guess we could say, that'll go the full length. 
it is going to be formal. We've agreed to a formal structure. And so in a way, it's the second. But in another way, it's the first official. So <laughs> uh, Digital Pit Boss, good to see you. I know you're excited for the William Bell debate coming up. And lively live chat. I'm having uh, some fun going through those those comments all. So make sure you're tagging me with your questions, though. We do have a Q&A period sometime after uh, the discussion. So Godzilla Freak says that debate was incomplete. Yeah, so that's even a, that's a better way to uh, call it. It'll be the first complete debate on geocentrism. So looking forward to that one for sure. Uh, okay, the one I was just advertising was... The Great Millennium Debate is the Thousand Years Future. Again, Pastor Anthony Aquino and Dr. Don Preston. The Great Millennium Debate, this is going to be in September. So again, if you're not yet subscribed, but you love debates on all sorts of topics, we've got a topic for you for sure. I mean, if you're into eschatology, we're going to have debates for you on that topic. If you're into dispensationalism or nature of God, soteriology, creation, evolution, we will have a debate for you to enjoy. And therefore, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Share this content around, guys. Critical thinking is important. It's why we host debates on all sorts of topics, because it's a way for us to get out of our personal echo chambers into the debate octagon to discuss differing views in a cordial and sophisticated manner. This one's coming up in a week. I'm excited for this one. The big rematch between Pastor Matt first and David Preston on the question, is God done with Israel? And just in time, Professor David McQueen is back with us. He's ready to go for a 40-minute discussion to remember, gentlemen. Uh, try to take it easy on each other. And <laughs> Jackson's smiling. So, okay, let's have some fun. We got 40 minutes on the clock and quite a few topics and points that I truly believe are worthy of some solid discussion. Jackson just ended with his rebuttal. Therefore, Professor McQueen, why don't we allow you to pick the first topic for the discussion? Okay. Uh, I would like to go to the topic that uh, Jackson introduced me to uh, a year ago, and that's the whole issue of why, are, why do we have a situation where from Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, all the way up through... Uh, the uh, entire evolutionary geologic column, if the flood model explains all these different layers, how come we would not find uh, shark teeth in uh, all of these different la layers, uh, sp specifically the ones uh, that are, um, uh, you know, Cambrian Ordovician? Uh, anticipating we would talk about sharks, shark teeth. I did some research preparing for this debate, uh, Jackson, and see if I have my information right. Uh, according to my study, the first sharks uh, don't appear in the Ordovician, as you said, but rather are found in the Silurian rocks by the evolutionary clock 420 million years ago. Um, sharks uh, produce thousands of teeth in a lifetime. As a matter of fact, check my figures here. I I seem to find that there were that there are 30,000 lost teeth uh, in a lifetime. So if we're saying that sharks have been around since the Silurian and some of them leave as, leave, lose as many as 30,000 teeth in a lifetime, how come we wouldn't find whole beds of shark teeth all throughout the rock record? That's my question for you, Jackson. What do you mean? Why don't we find them in the Silurian if sharks were in the Silurian? Well, according to my research, the, the first shark appears in the Silurian 420 million years ago, but that's not my really my point since I don't believe you know, in the old earth idea. But my, my point is 
you are presenting an argument for an old earth and millions of years of shark evolution if 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 my research is right and an individual shark can lose as many as 30,000 teeth in a lifetime why shouldn't we find uh whole units that are I see. 10 20 30 uh, uh meters thick just of teeth that's uh it's a good question not all teeth are going to fossilize but uh there's one uh formation especially called the jackson group funny enough in east arkansas you can sift out in the mud and literally there'll be 10 shark teeth in it i mean they're they're i've read a an account from from one woman on this on this forum she said in one creek the shark teeth are so plentiful if you put your hand on it it'll actually poke you in the in the hand with little shark teeth so shark teeth are plentiful in the fossil record okay donnie let's uh, let jackson ask me a question now i guess all right uh i'm gonna go to another uh, aquatic creature here's a, a sandbank pocketbook this is a shell i didn't kill it I don't, I don't collect live mussels but i did find the shell and these live in freshwater let's assume the ocean separated into layers like you said the freshwater saltwater told warm there are also saltwater species of clam mussels they're both at the bottom and they can't really go anywhere but the bottom where so how are they not in the same layer they either have to be in the fresh water or the salt water and we have two different varieties that have to be in the same layer so what, what would be your response to that okay and would you mind holding that polysipod back uh, so people could see it notice that this modern one if he holds it on the side has got a connector between the two valves and you can see that uh that this, that's why they call a bivalve. Uh, there's a connector between these two parts of the shell. Well, from my research, both in the Appalachians and also rocks that I've seen in uh, Peru when I did field work down there, when you look at the, the shells that you actually find in the rock record, uh, you find a real contrast between what he just held up. What I mean by that is when I have gone to uh, the beaches of southern Alabama and southern Mississippi that border the Gulf of Mexico, and me and my grandchildren go looking for shells, we, we generally find, and this is my attempt to quickly draw a, a pectin shell, we'll find one valve of, uh, of a clam but it's detached. You don't find um, a a layer in on a modern beach of clam shells that are uh, articulated like what you described there. But in my research in uh, Peru, I found a, a bed of uh, plesiopods where the the shells were were closed. They had been catastrophically buried by my viewpoint because it couldn't have been the case that if they laid around even for a year, much less the amount of time to create a, a layer, a 10 meter stick of, of, of plesiopods, uh, they would have all popped open. And so would you agree that finding a plesiopod with a closed shell would be an evidence of at least a local catastrophe. Sometimes, Jackson. but but not always, because I find dead ones that are long dead ones that are closed still, like maple leaf mussels. They have a heavy shell. They they stay closed for long periods of time, so it's not impossible for them to be buried long after they're dead and appear like it was they were alive. I, I've, I've literally a thousand shells I've collected. I've, it's kind of a new hobby. Well, that's good to know, but I also would critique you, my friend, because mm. uh, you're a young man. You have one lifetime. Mm. Um, how can you use that experience to comment about the geologic record? Oh, wait, I know. You take the viewpoint that the present is the key to the past. And so the observations that you make 
on your travels, whether they be in Arkansas or to the Caribbean beaches, they are supposed to apply through geologic time. And that's where my rub comes from, comes Jackson. All right. Well, I think a lot of, a lot of things probably have changed through the, the eons, but I think, uh, I mean, bivalves have been around since the Cambrian. And uh, I know, I know you guys don't view that as a, a, a view of time, but they they're all through the geologic column or they're, 500 or so million years old. Okay. Let me offer a critique to that, if that's okay, Donnie. Can I comment about what he said? One of the arguments that I have used many times, and you have heard me on my debates uh, use uh, arguments, I, don't, I want to return to paleobotany um, uh, later on in the debate, but for now, uh, what I want to talk about is what I call the Dwayne Gish two-step, the two-step dance. When I have gone to the Grand Canyon and I hiked it five times in four years uh, when I was at ICR, when I, when I have found a uh, trilobite, for example, or a plesiopod, it appears in the rock record fully formed and it appears abruptly, the two steps of Dwayne Gish's very old argument. The fully formed part, in my mind, is an argument for the creation of the plesiopod kind, and it applies to the dinosaur kind and other things. The fact that it appears abruptly in the rock record, to me, is an argument for a catastrophic viewpoint which I think is a better way to look at the sedimentary record. What do you think of this old Dwayne Gish argument? Well, from my research, the early Cambrian is uh, entirely made up of what they call small shelly fauna, which is tiny little shelled mollusks. And then from there, they get bigger throughout time. So it's not like we're having, uh, we're having bees suddenly appear in the early Cambrian out of nowhere. I think it's uh, it's a little bit different than that. Okay, uh, perhaps I haven't made my position clear to you, Jackson. I'm not saying that <clears throat> in the, uh, in a 6,000 year old earth, where we, let us say that uh, the uh, time of the great flood was 4,000 years ago, I'm not saying that there has been no uh, variation, no uh, no change in those uh, uh, in those years, and so I'm I'm aware that the the two dogs that got off the ark probably had the genetic potential potential to over time interbreed and form everything from a chihuahua to a, uh, a boxer. And so don't misunderstand me as saying the old argument that creationists used in 1600 that what we know as a species was, was fixed. The modern creationist biologists that I've studied and worked around as you pointed out in, in your previous discussion, uh, with certain types of creatures like a sponge, the kind might be at the family level. Uh, if you come to primates, the kind is probably at the genus level, since I'm not allowing any evolution from primates to uh, homo sapiens. And so um, don't misunderstand me as saying that in the 4,000 years since the flood that there has been no variation at all. Can you see what I'm saying there, Jackson? I, I see what you're saying, but uh, I, I want to say something about, you, you mentioned the Grand Canyon, 
and that gets brought up a lot in the, the flood debate. Yeah. I want to talk about another canyon briefly, the Waimea Canyon on Kauai. It formed in part by the collapse of the, the volcanic crater, but it formed two uh, forks. One fork's very shallow and one fork's very deep, the Waimea Canyon. The Waimea Canyon was carved out over time by uh, the Waimea River, and it, and it takes a long time to cut through this basalt rock. And the fact there are two forks, one fork's very shallow from the initial event that formed Waimea, part of Waimea Canyon. The other one is very deep. It's 3,000 feet deep, and it's 10 miles long. And I, I've seen it in person. It's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it, it couldn't have been formed in Noah's flood. How, how would you say it formed in that time frame? Okay. Um, I, I too, have visited Hawaii. Uh, Ms. McQueen and I went there for a week uh, back in uh, the 1980s. And I've, I've gone to the, to the big island to see the volcanic... Uh, area there uh, on the Big Island, and also uh, spent some time on Oahu um, and drove around that. As I've looked at it at the Hawaiian Islands from a creation standpoint, much of what you see um, involve post-flood activity. And one of the arguments that I like to use, let me get one of my props here, here to make it simpler to understand. This is a model of a uh, Impala. I think it's actually one from my high school days. Yeah, 1960 Chevy Impala. If you find uh, a car like this, that has been covered over by one of the volcanic flows in Hawaii, then you have a time marker so that you know that that flow that covered over this car had to be after the car was made in 1960. And so um, if you want to use something like this on Hawaii to try to make an estimate of the age of the earth, for example, here you have a modern volcanic uh, eruption that covers up a car. Well, when you go back to the uh, uh, Polynesian people that first came to Hawaii, and then you move forward in time to the Puritan missionaries that went to Hawaii in the 1800s, there are certain of those uh, flows that you can see uh, have been, you know, this was documented that it occurred in 1850. This one was documented that it occurred in 1910 and so forth. Creation scientists have gone to some of these documented flows uh, in Hawaii and taken samples. I guess the most famous example of this sort of thing is the work that Steve Austin and others did on some of the uh, volcanic flows in the Grand Canyon there's a huge discrepancy between the observed time, for example, in Hawaii, that the old missionary wrote down in his, his journal that this happened in 1880. Big discrepancy between that and the radiometric ages uh, of the minerals in that lava. What do you make of that kind of discrepancy, Jackson? Well, I know that Austin said that the samples he took weren't homogenous and they used potassium argon dating. Uh, being not homogenous, that means there's probably some older material still in there, some, some xenocrysts, some inclusions that make this, would make the sample appear older anyway. And, uh, and the, the Hawaiian islands, like the big island of Hawaii is only estimated to be about, well, it, based on radiometric dating, about 500,000, less than 500,000 years old. The big island, Kauai is the oldest island at about several million years old. Yeah. But, uh, and even Morris, uh, 
admitted he he took uh, inclusions xenocris to be tested with potassium argon dating. So you're kind of setting it up for failure when when you test that. Since you and I have spoken about sharks so much in our debate in the past, I uh, did some study on sharks, you know, ranging from megalodon down to uh, uh, an ordinary modern shark. And I was surprised to, to find that even the evolutionary community, when they talk about uh, at the family genus level, there are 350 different kinds of sharks, according to the research that I did. Um, in your thinking, with all that diversity in the shark family, uh, how come the sharks that lived through the, the flood could not have diversified into the 350 kinds that are talked about in our modern world? Well, I think most of the sharks wouldn't have survived the flood due to the turbulence and uh, the heat, mostly. Uh, maybe the salinity was slightly less. They probably could have been, they would probably have been fine through that. But uh, sharks diversity isn't really much of a problem, isn't really a point I brought up. But uh, let's talk about the evolution of sharks. Sharks found uh, in the Carboniferous period, there was recently a pretty complete shark found actually here in Arkansas. They named it Ozarkus. Okay. And uh, its jaw was pretty well preserved. They did CT scans on it and found it's actually very different than modern sharks. So when people say sharks are living fossils, kind of, but they've actually changed quite a bit based on this fossil that found an hour north of me. Uh, I plan to go look for more, actually. I want to go look for more fossils of those. Well, I'll, I'll have to uh, look into that. Yeah. Let me let me go back to another uh, argument that you've made uh, repeatedly, and um, again, um, well, let, let me. Why don't I start with paleobotany? Mm -hmm. um, the I did a prison presentation uh, on standing for truth about the very weak arguments associated with. Uh, with paleobotany, and you can uh, you can look at this uh, uh, on my list here. So I don't want to go go over every aspect of what's called Dolo's Law, uh, but I do want to talk for a moment about uh, what is called Cope's Law, and that is, in general, we find from an evolutionary standpoint, things go from small. To large sizes. I find that the paleobotany record shows enormous uh, trees and enormous uh, ferns, for example, buried that were buried that were living in the pre-flood world. And so, this whole idea of Cope's law, where uh, a fern begins its evolution quite small and then grows to be very large, how come we can't find in our modern world the equivalent firms that we see in uh, uh, Mississippi and Pen excuse me, Mississippi and Pennsylvania coal seams uh, in the American South? Sure, that's true. A lot of the plants like these, these calamites, which are horsetails, were much bigger than modern calamites that I, that I showed. Yes, uh, but that was in the Carboniferous. If we go back to say the Devonian, they were uh, plants were incredibly small. They were not. There were some some vascular plants, I believe, but they they weren't quite big enough to get. I mean, they weren't quite developed enough to get very large. So that would be my I, argument on that. I remember in my academic training in in paleontology, my professor at Tennessee. Spent an awful lot of time uh, talking about transitions uh, between amphibians, reptiles, mammals, all the way through that part. But he essentially skipped over a lot of paleobotany because uh, 
if you uh, go to do research on, okay, you've got um, conifers and you've got deciduous trees, how can you get from uh, some small kinds of, of plants evolving with time into the complex uh, life cycle of, say, a pine tree or a tulip poplar like I have in my backyard? I see paleobotany as a counter argument to the evolutionary viewpoint that you're presenting. How would you understand that? Well, I'm not well versed in plant transitional fossils, but I do know that there are some. But uh, I know that the, the conifers appear first in the fossil record, and then maybe in the, I want to say Jurassic, maybe Triassic, uh, deciduous trees uh, appear. Uh, so it would make sense that, that uh, maybe I'm getting this backwards. I think I'm getting that backwards, actually. Deciduous trees appear, then it's one of those. I'm, I'm not good with the, the plant record, but anyway. Well, let's go. Let's go on to, to another point you made about um, the necessity for certain types of uh, salamanders, uh, certain types of other creatures. The necessity of these creatures to have certain types of wood or certain types of diet in order to stay alive. Right. Um, as Noah had over a hundred years to really prepare for the ark. We know that the creatures came to him, snakes, um, lizards, and so forth. They came and presented themselves. He didn't have to go out and find them. But what he did have to prepare for was what these creatures would eat uh, on board the ark. And one argument I want to give to you from a, 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 a biblical standpoint is to think about the issue of the size of the ark in contrast to the size of most creatures that were on it. Uh, a fellow named Jan Petschkus, I've got his name here someplace, I think, um, I can get the spelling of it later. Um, Jan Petschkus did a study of animals on board the ark. He wrote under the nom de plume, John Wood Morrippy. And you may be aware of his analysis of the ark. When Dr. Morris was writing in the 50s, he assumed that the average size of a, of a creature on board the ark was probably the size of a sheep. Well, Petschkus went back and looked at uh, the uh, 900, looked, looked at uh, 900 genera of creatures between 1 and 10 grams, think in terms of a hunting, hummingbird, over 2,000 genera of creatures between 10 and 100 grams, think of a rat, and then there are only 250 genera of, of creatures that are between one, ten, one ton and 10 tons. Think of a hippo there. And then when you get up to dinosaurs and bigger creatures like elephants, there's only 53 genera. And so when you think about that in terms of the uh, data from the uh, book of Genesis, you know, you've got a vessel that's 450 feet long, 75 feet by 45 feet. And it fits this critical ratio that's needed in naval architecture of 10 to 1. And so when you work through all this data, even when you talk about the amount of water that would be needed on board the ark, uh, which comes up to around 3 million liters of water it turns out that from his research that would only fill about half of the ark if you allow juveniles to be brought on board 
So when I think about a creature that we find in the rock record, like this is uh, one of my Cajun buddies, uh, got a Louisiana snapping turtle, and he was kind enough to give me the this part of the skull of it. Uh, when when we uh, uh, look at this and, and think about it, this kind of uh, this kind of creature appears abruptly and fully formed. I don't think that I can find even in the evolutionary literature some sort of evolution among the turtle kind. You think I'm missing something, Jackson? I think so. There's Papa Shelley's and Odonta Shelley's, which basically have one has no shells and broadened ribs, and one has a plastron but no carapace. So there are tur turtle transitional fossils. But uh, it's not so much the food space that I'm thinking of here. It's, it's uh, the specific requirements for the certain kinds, like pangolins. You yeah. have to have freeze-dried uh, insects for them and all the ant-eating varieties for a year. You need fresh eucalyptus for the, the koala kind. You can't have just like hay-style eucalyptus. It can't be dried out. They won't eat it. And they, it has no, no nutritional value if you dry it out. It has little nutritional value anyway. Uh, so you have to have fresh eucalyptus for a year for the koalas alone. I think something like 1,400 pounds, I think, is what I calculated, the fresh eucalyptus for a pair of koalas for that year. Donnie, I don't want to keep talking to Jackson when there may be questions from the audience. Are we getting close to when we want to begin that part of our discussion? David, feel free to respond to any of the points Jackson just made. We still have about 11 minutes left for the discussion. Okay, very well. Um, okay, let me, let me go to the Bible, which I consider to be a a, a trustworthy uh, historical record. And this is a, a, a modern paraphrase of, uh, uh, of the old King James. Um, and this new book I'm working on called Rock Forensics, you know, if you're going to be a forensic scientist, you have to find a crime scene. And so the question I've asked myself is, what is the crime that brought on the Great Flood? And are the sedimentary rocks that we find worldwide actual evidence of this, uh, of this crime being punished? In other words, a forensic approach to the sedimentary rock record. In Genesis 6, beginning with verse 5, um, we can talk about something that I'm curious to know if Jackson has come to the viewpoint that mankind is basically good or bad. Here's the evaluation in Genesis 6. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, verse 5, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. That's a very unique translation of that of that verse there. I like it. It was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race that I've created from the face of the earth. And so as I think about my argument that the rock record is an evidence of a catastrophic judgment on the earth. I'm curious to know if Jackson, as you walk down the path of life, the average guy you run into in Walmart, the average person, is he basically good or bad? Well, I think everybody has a little bit of good and bad in them, but I like to think most people are mostly good. I know that you're good. Donnie's good. Most people in the comments are probably good. Uh, so I think well, I would like Jackson, to say good. Jackson, I'm, I'm complimented by you saying that. I should go get Mrs. McQueen and have her have some comments after 50 years of marriage as yeah. to exactly how good I am uh, uh, in doing dishes and other things. <laughs> but uh, I do understand the point that you're making, but I, 
simply disagree with it. I think that we are sinful people that need to be redeemed. Donnie? I'm sorry, I got distracted with the uh, live chat. We have a very lively live chat, and I'm just saving the final questions here. Gentlemen, are you saying you didn't want to do the full 40 minutes? Oh, no, I just lost track of time. Jackson and I get talking about things. How much time do we have left of the 40? We just hit the 31 minute mark. So we got nine minutes oh, okay. left. Nice. All right. And Let then me, I think uh, when we hit the 40 minute mark, I'm going to add another 40 minutes of discussion as bonus minutes. Well, good, <laughs> good. I'm, I'm rested. I'll be able to do it. Jackson, go ahead. I, I challenged you with a thought. Go ahead All and right. challenge me with something I brought up. All right, let's uh, let's talk about something I brought up. Here's a uh, Luna moth. I found it dead in the forest because they only live for a week. They breed and they die. Here it is, right here. Now, they they lay their eggs on like oak trees, citrus trees, uh, sweet gums, things like that. All of these would be underwater during the flood, and you can't really grow a forest in the ark. Uh, so why why do they still exist? Okay, it's a good good point. And a lot of the discussion in the creation science literature going back to World War II doesn't deal with some of the things that you're interested in, sharks and moths and, and so forth. So we are uh, uh, cutting some new ground here. And let me uh, uh, give an idea of, of my thinking about this. Noah had over 100 years to prepare the ark before the animals actually came. And because I believe in miracles, and I believe that uh, Noah was instructed in areas that he otherwise could never have known about, I think that he, he brought on board the ark um, sections, maybe 10, 20 feet sections, of wood type one, wood type two, and so forth, so that as the insects were on board the ark, and you've, you've commented about how some of these uh, moths and so forth have a very brief life, life, lifespan. Uh, a creature like that, it doesn't mean if there was one year 360 days on board the ark. It could be that some of these insects that you point out could have gone through several cycles, starting with the two that were there and uh, lived all the way through the 360 days. So you've challenged me to think about if some of these creatures need a certain kind of wood or a certain type of, uh, diet, for lack of a better word, I think that could have been uh, dealt with by Noah in his selection, for example, of the different woods to put on, on the ark. Not what the ark was built of, but rather the kinds of wood that would be in the insect area of the ark. Right, but the, the Luna moth, cata the caterpillars, they don't eat the wood, they eat live leaves. So they would have had to have grown trees on the ark for that to work. That might work for some beetle species, but for butterflies and moths, it wouldn't. Well, I don't know. I, I uh, When I think about um, the provision that God made uh, for insects on the ark, uh, I don't see that as a... Um, As a, as a super big problem. I think that from your evolutionary viewpoint, the observation that's been made worldwide that when we find a fossil clam or we find a uh, fossil of a stegosaurus or we find a fossil of a uh, saber-toothed tiger, 
those fossils appear abruptly and fully formed. Now, I must admit that one of the areas that you and I have discussed in the past that I continue to work on and is a real uh, research issue for uh, creation science. Keep in mind at my day in, at ICR, when Dr. Morris would send us out in the 1980s, he would say, remind the audience that we are the Institute for Creation Research, not the Institute for Creation Answers. So I don't have an answer for everything. But as we continue to do research in these, uh, in these areas that you've introduced, certainly I think we can say that when it comes to plesiopods, gastropods, uh, they, they appear abrupt, abruptly and fully formed. I like to go back to a story that I love telling. I'll abbreviate it for this discussion. And that is, how do we get the word Cambrian? I mean, where did the word, word Cambrian ever came, come from? Well, it turns out that the professor, Reverend Adam Sedgwick, would take his students during, the, uh, during their field trips to a certain part of Wales where the Cambry tribe lived. And there he would show them red sandstones with trilobites in it, a green mineral called glauconite. And so year after year, he would take these students there to this part of Wales. And so I, I imagine him one day saying, I'm not going to list all these characteristics one through 10. I'm just going to take the word of the tribe, Cambry, and call that the Cambrian group. And it will have all those characteristics. And then we when he would take the young people, or when he would take the students, the university students, to Devonshire, to look at fish fossils, then he would say, well, let's call that Devonian. And so the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, and so forth were not only coined by creationists, but also refer to specific localities in England and Europe, Paris Basin, that kind of thing. So that's my counter argument Jackson, to much of the evolutionary time scale that you talk about um, in the development of geology up until the time of Darwin, really, uh, most geology was done by people that, by scientists and lawyers and so forth, they didn't have a problem with a 6,000 year old earth. Sure. Let's, uh, if we still have time, is there time? Let me, I just wanted to get an update on that. So we have, you know, what? we have one minute left. All right. We can, can we, just go to the questions if you want then. We do have five minute closing statements in order to okay. give you gentlemen the opportunity to wrap up your thoughts and points. So why don't we do that? Jackson, okay. there might be a few things you wanted to respond to or just a few points you felt needed to be addressed. David, you as well. Uh, David, since you started being in the affirmative, let's give you the first five minute close or five minute closing, then we'll give Jackson a five minute. So David, whenever okay. you're ready, Good. go ahead. Let me uh, set my watch here because I do have some important things that I want to uh, uh, talk about. I certainly want to compliment Jackson for the amount of time that he's taken in the past and certainly for this debate in order to bring up these uh, points. I uh, think that the idea that uh, Dr. Dick Bliss, uh, Dr. Gish and others talked about in the 1980s, the idea of a two model approach in American education, I think it would be very helpful as I have, as I have been in my life, a high school biology teacher, uh, I was given the freedom here in Louisiana to teach two models to understand 
uh, what is man according to evolution, what is man uh, according to uh, scripture. And so when I think about that in terms of our debates here on standing for truth, it's important to me that we always circle back to the Bible because the creationist viewpoint, although there are other religions and viewpoints uh, that, for example, the whole idea of intelligent design, they come to a, to a certain point, but they don't necessarily talk about God. There, there must have been a designer in the past. The old argument from Paley, if you find a watch on the beach, there must be a watchmaker someplace. And that's a, that's a good argument. But the, the viewpoint that, that I want to come to as we, as we talk about these things is that um, it's important to me to defend as a geologist the first 11 chapters of Genesis because it forms a foundation for the critique of the Bible. It has been a point of debate for uh, thousands of years, really, going back to rabbinical tradition even, but especially uh, in the 1700s and 1800s, the focus has been on, is the Bible a trustworthy uh, document? If evolution is true, the sort of evolution that of insects, for example, and salamanders, that Jackson has referred to tonight, if that is uh, actually true, then uh, you can do without a creator. You can say man has risen over the years from uh, simple and then more and more intelligent as time went on, went on. And so you find an evolution of culture and so forth. That is not what is uh, uh, talked about uh, in, in the Bible. Uh, and I want to end with a Bible passage that we don't routinely think about uh, in regard to um, um, this creation evolution debate. And if you want to turn over to Revelation 22, I'm going to read from the last chapter of the Bible uh, regarding the importance of this argument from Genesis to uh, Revelation. Um, the issue of human sin goes all the way uh, to a, a discussion of Jesus's return. So in Revelation 22, beginning with verse 7, it says, Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of the prophecy written in this book. I, John, am the one that heard and saw these things. And so it, then it goes on to say this. Then this angel instructed him, do not seal up of the prophetic words of this book. For the time is near. For the time is near. Let the one who is doing harm continue to do harm. Let the one who is vile continue to be vile. Let the one who is righteous continue to live righteously. Let the one who is holy continue to be holy. And then the Lord Jesus interrupts this flow by saying this, Look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So part of my votive for defending the first chapters of Genesis is if they are true, then you can equally trust the uh, book of John where uh, we find written, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Thank you for the time, Donnie. My pleasure, David. 
Thank you very much for that five minute closing statement. Jackson Rowe, we now have your five minute closing statement. And so whenever you're ready, please let me know. And the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thanks guys for doing this. Thank you, David. Uh, I don't really have any further points to make. I just want to say, uh, I, I don't necessarily argue that there's no God. I think there doesn't necessarily need to be one, but there could be one guiding the process of evolution. I think a lot of Christians think that way. Uh, I don't think it's a dichotomy between the two. I don't think it has to be that way, but, uh, yeah, it was a fun debate. So, uh, I hope to debate David again on another subject sometime soon and yes i mean yeah that's, that's all i really have to say thanks for for doing this jackson unfortunately you're banned from uh debating david you're far too mean <laughs> way too aggressive <laughs> too much heat so it's, it's the last time gentlemen it's, it's too hard to moderate yeah. the two of you you Don, know donnie before <laughs> i go on to the rest of the audience questions would you drop my video so i can go get some water to drink sure okay Do We'll just hang out here. We'll just hang out. Uh, me and Jackson will have an impromptu debate for the next right. five minutes. Uh, consider it one of those Marvel after credit scenes, or maybe pre credit scenes, since we still have the um, we still have the audience question. So, Jackson, you ever heard of genetic entropy? I'm just kidding. We'll save that I for another it. day. <laughs> five minutes won't be enough. Yeah. So, I'll just um, I'll go over a couple reminders for everybody although earlier i went through quite a few uh reminders and announcements so for anybody who wasn't here for that uh check out the upcoming live stream section also check out on the standing for truth website standfortruthministries.com i have uh updated it quite a bit put a lot more content in the video section i'm currently working with the website designer to put a whole new section just called guests and uh, it'll be a long list of all of the different phd scientists and apologists that have been on the channel and you'll be able to find all of their uh, shows with us very easily uh, through that section on the website uh, so that being said we do have within the next couple of days another uh two-in-one show and uh, open mic. So this will be a debate, Dr. Dino versus James W. and Amy Newman, followed by an open mic. So this will occur either tomorrow or Friday for sure. Um, and then next week, I think it is, we're going to be having another open mic, this time Jackson Rowe and Kent as the main event, and then followed uh, up by an open mic. So for those that love impromptu open mic debates, we have quite a few for you in the next month or two. And with that, Professor McQueen looks like he's all refilled and topped on his water. Yes. And so let's get right into it. Okay, we'll start right at the beginning. Um, okay, Super Chat comes in from Doc. Appreciate it. And so he's asking, Mr. McQueen, any interest in a possible duo debate on this topic? A friend and I are geologists who disagree with you on if the flood occurred. David, looks like there's a debate challenge to keep you busy, brother. Yeah, and uh, I love this name. Uh, the German Dr. Dino. I, I like that, uh, <laughs> the way he says that. Uh, and yes, uh, Donnie has been looking for a year for a professional geologist that would be willing to take some of the topics that I have discussed, the catastrophic nature of the sedimentary record, the origin of crude oil, natural gas, the topic of the origin of copper, lead, zinc, gold, silver deposits. Uh, I would uh, welcome uh, you and your friend uh, to uh, discuss this uh, with me, uh, as a father of four children, I'm used to duo debates of not just two people, but sometimes four <laughs> people. So uh, I would welcome that. Thank you, sir. Four on one, David. You're used to it, right? Right. Okay, brother. Appreciate it. Okay, next question comes in from 
Centurion 737. Question four, Jackson. He's coming at you, Jackson. And so his question is, why do you use so much speculation instead of scientific evidence to support your religion of evolution, Jackson? How do you respond? Why do I use so much speculation? I don't know. I think most of my presentation wasn't speculation. Uh, so I'm not sure. Maybe in the pa past debate, he's referring to something. Uh, but uh, I don't think I use too much speculation. And I don't think evolution is really a religion. I mean, if you showed me, again, uh, something like a modern-looking turtle fossil found in the Cambrian that pretty much falsifies evolution as we know it. So it's not a, re a religion. You can you can pretty easily falsify it. But, but I challenged Centurion to go out to the Burgess Shale and uh, find a turtle fossil or something similar. May I? Okay, thank you. May of I make course, a yeah, on David, that point? go ahead. Uh, see, I, I challenge Jackson on this because in my study of philosophy and of different world religions, um, I think that every religious viewpoint, and certainly my uh, acceptance of the Bible as a historical document, I believe I have evidence, you know, I have evidence that shows where Abraham lived and certainly have evidence of uh, Jewish historians talking about Jesus and saying, if it be lawful to call him a man. And so I think I have evidence to support uh, the Bible, but there's also an aspect of faith in it. In my discussions with evolutionists going back to the early seventies, when I first got an interest in this, and was a student at University of Tennessee, University of Michigan, I have found that as you move to a certain point in an evolutionary uh, argument, it is faith-based. You have to have faith, for example, in the idea of uniform process. Wouldn't that part of it be true, Jackson, that you have to have faith in uniform process? Well, I don't think it's just uniform processes. I mean, like, uh, there are catastrophic events that happen from time to time. So you have to take that into account. And Amen. surely there are ways that take uh, that uh, check that to see if what happened in the like the geologic column. Was this a catastrophic event or does this appear to be laid down slowly? And of course, I'm not a geologist, but anyway, anyway that would be my answer. Thank you, Donnie. Okay, I appreciate it. All right, next question comes in from now one of your biggest fans, David McQueen. Crybaby. Creation, creationist crybaby. And so the question is, David, can you explain the presence of marine fossils on mountains? Often the fossils are in the same positions as they grow in life and not scattered from a flood. Okay, Um Crybaby, this is a very important point, and let me uh, get back to my uh, whiteboard here and find my eraser, because this is a very common misunderstanding. A lot of people use Mount Everest, for example, as an example of uh, what you're talking about, and um, it's an incorrect way to think about uh, marine, fo marine fossils. Rather, you say the presence of marine fossils on mountains, and it really should be written marine fossils in mountains. And let me give you an example here. Um, I'm going to draw a cross section, so I want to put a tree here. And we've got a mountain here. And we're looking at, at a cross section of it. And when we look at two different uh, strata, there may be in the lower part here a clam. 
and then above that uh, there might be a uh, <clears throat> let's say a tree fossil um, like a leaf or something okay when you actually hike up the mountain and you look here you can dig back in this layer and find clams going completely through it and then you go up and you do find a tree fossil but the correct way to think about this is not that this clam is somehow attached there and attached here and there's a tree attached there and a tree attached there the catastrophic sedimentation that I've talked about in this debate would explain these layers and then the tectonic forces of the great flood would explain them being um, uh, tilted. And so when you ask the question, are they growing in the same positions? Well, it turns out that in certain uh, fossil corals, for example, they, they do seem to be oriented in growth position. But in my experience, in looking at the clams and so forth, the clams are not like what Jackson has shown from his own research, but rather uh, they are disarticulated, broken into two halves uh, in uh, some layers. And then you can go down below and you can find the complete bivalve, which has been catastrophically buried. And so I hope that explains to you, Crybaby, uh, why they're not scattered during the flood. Appreciate it, David. Jackson, floor is yours. All right. Well, I kind of want to talk about something similar, but uh, I found uh, bryozoa, trilobites, and bivalves all in the same geologic layer in northwest Arkansas all together. It was actually, actually on my uncle's property. Uh, pretty much every rock has some form of fossils in them. Some of them, are, uh, the bryzoa, have delicate fronds and stems. They're very, very large. And you'd think these would have been broken up by the flood. You'd think these things that are said to have lived together would be sc scattered. Why, are, why do we only find trilobites below the Permian? Like this, this is a Carboniferous formation. Uh, just order like that doesn't make a lot of sense in light of a global flood to me. Okay, thank you, Jackson. Professor McQueen, you get the final word. Question was for you. The argument that you've heard me make and Jackson respond to over the years, the idea of ecological zonation uh, during the flood it's logical to me as a flood geologist that in ordinary circumstances, you would find marine fossils stratigraphically beneath uh, terrestrial fossils like uh, dinosaurs, mastodons, and so forth. So it, that sort of sequence can be better explained, I think, by the Great Flood. Okay, I appreciate the responses, gentlemen, and to Creation's Crybaby, thank you for the question. Okay, next one comes in from Centurion again, and it's for you, Jackson. And so he's asking, you stated that certain animals could not have survived in salty waters. Why are you assuming that the water was salty at the time of Noah's flood when there's no evidence of it? All right, let's assume it was all fresh water then. And suddenly, I mean, I guess everything at the time, even the coral, the uh, the fish, everything was living in fresh water. Then suddenly it became salt water during the time of the flood. And they have basic, basically no adjustment time. Uh, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I would like to respond to that, uh, 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 to that comment. In the model for the Great Flood that George in Australia, George Bond and I have been working on for the last year, there are areas of zonation 
In other words, if you look at the column of water and in the model that we're building, we're, we're proposing that the initial uh, a column of the flood water was uh, around 10,000 feet of water. Why? Because our model suggests that there were no pre-flood mountains higher than 10,000 feet. And so you got this column of 10,000 feet of water, but there would be zones in it, zones of salinity, high salinity, zones of fresh water and mixing and so forth. So that one of the responses to Jackson's critique of the flood is the sensitivity of salinity for different kinds of uh, fish. Well, in, in, in my thinking now, those fish would move toward a zone of salinity that they would be uh, comfortable with. But a good argument for the worldwide flood are the Green River fish fossils found out west. There are just thousands of these things that were pretty fine-grained uh, sediment, but there are thousands of these fish that were uh, killed and buried very rapidly, you can uh, almost see the contents of uh, uh, of their stomachs and so forth. And this was a group of fish that were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And when that salinity and sedimentation uh, changed, uh, they were buried very rapidly. The fact they're not disarticulated, the fact that you can uh, figure out what even, uh, and again, I don't know the taxonomy, but family or genus of these fish, uh, that's an argument of from Dwayne Gish from 50 years ago. The idea that they are being formed abruptly and they are fully formed uh, during this catastrophic process. So, uh I would not present the argument that the water, the pre-flood ocean, Noah's ocean, I call it, I would not argue that that was fresh water. Thank you, David. Uh, Jackson, question was for you, so you get the last word. All right, sounds like we slightly agree, but uh, on the at least the fresh water thing. But the part about the zone of uh, fresh water, let's assume that they stay perfectly level and they live in there then you have to take into account the temperature that the the fish have to live in uh, and we have to assume that the freshwater layer is also the correct temperature for that species and some species it wouldn't be some species it would be so i think that's uh, a, a good counter argument to that and my follow-up to that jackson is george bond and i have been working for the last year on the whole idea of what could be a heat sink that would take some of the high temperatures away from catastrophic plate tectonics, for example. But in the example that you're giving, a heat sink that would pull some of that heat away from the flood during the great flood. So uh, we'll come back to that. Now, those of you that are students watching Standing for Truth for the first time, I hope you can understand the happiness of this back and forth between Jackson and Donnie and me. We are scientists pursuing a scientific theory. And I was taught, and I hope you've been taught, that if you've got multiple working hypotheses, the one that fits the data best is the one you should accept. Thank you. Thank you, David. Jackson, since it was your question, did you want a quick final word on anything? Uh, no, we can move to the next one. Okay. All right. Next question comes in from Beamsy. And the question is for David. And so Be Beamsy asks, how would you explain Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone? It has 24 forests buried in volcanic ash with lithified soils in between. This cannot happen by a flood. Well, Beamsy, you have certainly read the sign there in Yellowstone that has been produced by 
park rangers following an evolutionary viewpoint. Now, Specimen Ridge from a creationist standpoint would be best explained in this way. Um, um, let's see. Dr. Steve Austin has done a tremendous amount of work on what the lake that was formed after the eruption of Mount St. Helens actually looks like. He and I were colleagues at ICR when he took scuba and went up there and looked at what he saw as factual destruction of a forest during the eruption of Mount St. Helens and producing the lake that was there. Well, in his diving there, taking his life in his own hands, when he when he went down, he found that many of the trunks of trees were not floating horizontally, but rather vertically. And as they became waterlogged, they would move down and it would be the illusion that they were in the growth position. I would suggest to you that there's not 24 forests there in Yellowstone or perhaps a, a, different, a better way to think of it from a flood geology standpoint is the volcanic ash and the trees from hundreds of miles away from Yellowstone as that particular area was being deposited uh, give the illusion of 24 forests, but it's not really. The, the issue of the creationist viewpoint of Yellowstone has been the topic of field trips in the past. And um, I will, before our next debate, uh, pass some of these references on to Donnie so we can add it to my reference list. Would would you make a note, Donnie, to remind me of that? And we can help Beamsy on this point. Absolutely, David. Appreciate it. Jackson, anything you'd like to add or respond to? Yeah, my response would be, uh, the fact that wouldn't there just be one layer if if it was formed by water, one layer of trees? We have to, we have to have twenty four layers stacked on top of them in this lake to produce it. Even either way, you have to have twenty four successive events to make well, twenty four layers. Right now, now we are getting into uh, some divisions of Earth history. As I've commented before, the flood lasted a full year. There was phase one, phase two, phase three. Well, after that, in my flood model, there is what's called, what I call, a post-flood residual catastrophe period where there is the impoundment of lakes like Lake Bonneville and other lakes in the western United States that formed uh, uh, barriers and then when those barriers were breached, that's when the Grand Canyon was actually eroded through this uh, post-flood catastrophic event. And the same thing applies to some of these uh, localities like Yellowstone. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't necessarily think that it has to be uh, 24 forests grown a hundred years apart uh, for 2000 years after the flood. I, I don't think that's necessary to interpret this. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate the uh, responses on that one. And Donnie, can I make a quick comment? Sure. I have, uh, I've got about enough voice for two more questions for me. And then I'd like to turn it over to you and Jackson to finish it off. Please. No problem. What I was going to say is we'll pick one more question because we are coming at the 25 minutes for audience Q&A. And so we'll do one more question, allow you both to respond, and then we're going to wrap it up for tonight. You both have, have done a great job, and I appreciate the work you both, uh, David and Jackson, put into preparing for this Genesis flood debate. So, okay, here we go. Final question for tonight, and it's for you, David. Another one from your biggest fan, Creationist Crybaby. Okay. And so, and so CC asks, David, not a single mammal 
bird or flowering plant is fossilized in any rocks of the Grand Canyon, yet they are abundant in the younger rocks of the Grand Staircase. Can you please explain? Okay. Um, when you look at the rocks of the Grand Canyon and you use the standard scale, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvania, I've seen um, trilobites and the rocks that I would associate with the Cambrian of Dr. Sedgwick that I told, talked about earlier. I've seen those clearly in the, the Grand Canyon. Ordovician rocks, like I was taught uh, in East Tennessee, uh, the kinds of, of rocks that uh, involved a shale and then a limestone and a dolomite. I don't, I don't see those right above the Cambrian. And so Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, there's a debate about whether there are any Silurian at all in, in the Grand Canyon, but certainly there is a small amount of Devonian. Now, why would, even, why would we even apply the word Devonian? Well, there are some fish fossils uh, that have been found that match the top locality in Devonshire in England, so they're called Devonian. Carry out some dinner, Miss Penny Pearl, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvania, Permian. Well, the uh, flood provides an explanation for um, the, the rocks of the canyon, for example, the Tapete Sandstone. But as you go up what's called the Grand Staircase, in other words, you go to the north rim of the canyon and begin driving all the way up into Utah to Dinosaur National Monument, for example, not far from Provo, Utah, you do find uh, mammals and birds and flowering plants in the units uh, there and in the units above the Grand Canyon, stratigraphically above the Grand Canyon. Uh, so that would be my answer to that, crybaby. David, appreciate it. And appreciate your response to these. A lot of these questions are, are, are technical. And so it's good we have an audience who's willing to engage the technical side of, of this topic. Jackson, now, any thoughts? Let oh. me, well, I want to hear what Jackson says, and then I have a George Bond comment. All right. <laughs> Well, I think it's pretty unlikely that in the in the flood, not a single place in the world, a leaf wouldn't get washed into the Cambrian or Ordovician or Silurian rock. Uh, that's just my, I mean, I'll have a, a lot more to say about that with the, the fossil record debate coming up with Ken Hovind, but that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. And so my George Bond comment is, listen, Donnie, I'm at the end of my rope, and so I'm going to thank Jackson and you, and I'm going to move my curse down. Actually, you, before you leave, David, David, before you leave, yeah, don't leave us just yet. It's like you're being raptured. I'm going to wrap it up here in ten, in, in all within ten seconds, and we'll all leave at the same time. Well, Keep that's extra kind of formal. You, you rarely nice say thing. anything in ten seconds, so I'm <laughs> on the edge of my so, seat. Starting now, ten seconds. Everybody, thanks for tuning in been a great debate. David and Jackson always do a good job and keeping it uh, respectful. Last thing I'll say, Dr. Dino, $2 super chat says also real quick, uh, doc in the chat, post the link. I gave you a temporary wrench for that. He says he's got an after show. So anyone who wants to continue the conversation, feel free to uh, join the after show with that Jackson, David, thank you so much for this. And thank you guys. Danny for truth. Good night, friends. Good night.